Tracy Jacobson, headmistress of the Buddha Dukai, and today I am making a follow-up video or a part two to the uh, topic witchcraft within ninjutsu. Now, if this is the first time that you've seen one of my videos, I started the Buddha Dukai back in 2004 as a way to teach authentic ninjutsu and classical samurai bujutsu. So, if you guys are interested in ninjutsu and samurai warfare, check out our website www.budodyninjutsu.com. Now, this is going to be a follow-up video to part one, witchcraft with the ninjutsu. If you guys missed part one and you did not see that particular video, this one might lose you. So, I've provided a link right here. Take this link and go watch part one, gather that information, and then come back and watch part two because some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in this video, if you didn't watch that one, you might be a little lost, okay? So uh, yes, click this link right here and check that out and then come on back if you're still interested. Right, so Witchcraft with the Ninjutsu Part 2. The first thing that I want to do is tackle some of the questions that came up from Part 1. Um, oddly enough, the questions that uh, came up from Part 1 had absolutely nothing to do with the topic. The topic was Witchcraft and within Ninjutsu, okay? And everybody else wanted to take the topic and then forget that that was the topic and then talk about religion. So I want to formally make a statement right now. Um, I do not care what religion you practice. Uh, what you practice is what you practice, and that should be something very sacred and special to you, and uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with me. So this is not a, I believe this religion, you believe that religion, and everyone's bickering about religion, okay? Um, I don't care, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just trying to say that I just don't care, okay? So you guys can practice whatever religion you want, freedom of religion, and go over a good time. But keep in mind, guys, freedom of religion means freedom of religion. So uh, if you believe in freedom of religion, then you shouldn't be burning me at the stake for the way that I practice mine, right? So, uh, yes, when I did talk about part one, I talked uh, about paganism, and I talked about the Abrahamic religion and, and how that goes down the line. So when I was trying to create this image for you guys, I was using terms that are used with academic historians. People will actually study and teach religious studies. I realize that you believe one thing and your book says that and that's perfectly well and good. However, I was just trying to create a mental image of what paganism is, okay? Paganism or pagan religion are religions that practice the ritual of more than one god. An example, and only an example to paint an image, would be a religious practice that has a um, ritual for the sun god the moon goddess, those type of religious rituals. And I'm being very generic, I'm just trying to paint a picture. And when you look at it, those are the religions that predate what we see as the Abrahamic religion. Typically, in the Abrahamic religion, you have, it comes down, now you see the practice of just one god. Okay, now I made that statement, and apparently it irritated a lot of people, and I do realize that um, there is a difference between what people believe and what people can prove. And I understand that. And just because someone believes a certain thing, that doesn't mean that that particular book that you're reading uh, aligns itself with history. So, and I'm not trying to piss anybody off. I'm just trying to say that I'm trying to say things that are historically accurate. And for someone to say that I was not historically accurate, they are being not historically accurate. So let's take the idea of ninjutsu. Some people say ninjutsu started in the time of the gods. It happened, you know, way, way back in the day. And then there are some people that believe ninjutsu started um, because uh, the Chinese monks and uh, the Chinese influenced Japan and uh, as the travels from uh, that particular com country and the trade with China, uh, people came over to Japan and the Art of War by Sun Tzu, which had spies and information about spies and things like that, that influenced the Japanese and influenced the Japanese military to then develop their own um, idea of unconventional warfare and spying and assassination, etc., etc., and there became the birth of ninjutsu. So you have, again, you have two mindsets. You have the people that believe ninjutsu started in the age of the gods. And then you got people that believe that ninjutsu started when, you know, a lot of the Chinese war manuals uh, started coming down and in Japan, and the Japanese received this particular transmission and then developed their study, like off of Sun Tzu's Art of War and the chapter that really talked about spies and things like that. And then from that became ninjutsu. Same thing when I'm talking about religion. Of course, there are people who believe, no, our religion started you know, all this many years ago. I don't care what you believe, okay guys? So let's can the religious bit because um, as actually a no purpose 
within this particular video at all. What is important is that witchcraft is a major aspect within ninjutsu. It is. Now that really turns people the wrong way because of the religious aspect. Okay, but if you study ninjutsu, you have to accept that there is a part of ninjutsu that you may or may not believe and that you may or may not understand. However, even if you study ninjutsu or you practice ninjutsu, whatever the words that you want to use, if you totally discredit the witchcraft and the magic aspect of ninjutsu, you are taking away the mindset, the way that they believed, um, and you're taking that out of it. And if you if you take the fuel away from the particular engine, it has a problem running correctly. Now, I'm not saying that you have to practice witchcraft. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you have to believe in witchcraft. But if you actually study ninjutsu, you would have to study the witchcraft or the magic that the ninja did at that time because you would want to have a deeper essence or a deeper understanding of the way that they thought at that time in history. So for someone to say that they study and practice ninjutsu, but they take all the magic and the witchcraft and all that kind of stuff and they just wad it up and they throw it over there and all they do is study the physical technique and then they turn around and they type, you know, on some message board somewhere, well, I am looking for the essence of ninjutsu. Well, that's crap. You're not looking for the essence of ninjutsu. You're just looking for techniques, you know? So because the essence is deeper than a technique. So you, you cannot lose the mentality or the mindset or what they believed at the time. Because once you lose that, all it is is just action. All it is is a technique. Now, in Anthony's second video, he talked about the differences between Genjutsu and uh, Majutsu, or Maho, and which I think is absolutely wonderful. If you guys watched my uh, video part one, which, again, here's a link for you. If you guys watched my video part one, I actually go over that, the differences between Genjutsu, Majutsu, Maho, and um, in the video description, you know, I've also placed the kanji and all that kind of stuff, so you guys can use that if you wanted to research it. But I think it was a, a great way for him to um, have a follow-up video with some of the information that I placed in part one, and he really painted a really good picture about the differences. And I think that's great because you should understand there's a major difference between Genjutsu and then Majutsu or Maho, which is the witchcraft and the magic aspect found within Ninjutsu. Now one thing I want to touch on a little bit is the word magic. People are using that word in the incorrect way. Magic isn't like, you know, Here's my hand. Oh, look, I have fire in my hand. That's genjutsu. That's an illusion technique. Magic is using the energy, the force around us, and using that particular energy as a way to help or benefit you or to benefit someone else. Now, you can either use that particular force or energy yourself, or you can manipulate that force or that energy. And when you use the elemental aspects that we talked about with the Gogil, right? When you use these particular elements, it's given to us from the gods, and you use that force and that energy, and you either use it as a benefit to yourself or someone else, or you manipulate that energy and use it as a benefit to yourself or someone else. That's magic. It's using the things that was already given to us from the gods. When you're using something that is man-made and you manipulate something that's man-made or you manipulate something to trick someone's eye or that's a setup, like pulling a rabbit from the hat, that's genjutsu. Okay, majutsu or maho is something much deeper and very spiritual. Now, like I talked about in part one, I practice Wicca, uh, so witchcraft is a major part of my life. It's Wicca is my religion, but there's a major difference between Wicca uh, and that type of witchcraft and what we see in the Japanese uh, ninjutsu. What we see in ninjutsu is killing. Like one of the magical techniques is to pull the eyes from a black dog and, you know, all this kind of stuff. There's never any killing uh, in Wicca. There's no sacrifice. That none of that kind of thing. In Wicca, it's a, it's, a, it's a nature religion. So we would never want to do anything that harms religion. We wouldn't want to kill anything. However, in the Japanese, you see that. You see they, they kill this dog or, you know, take the vagina from this dog and the penis from this dog when they're mating and on, the, on a full moon of this month and that day, you want to bury it and all this kind of stuff. Um, so there's lots of uh, killing and harming um, in the ninjutsu uh, variation of magic, where in Wicca you don't see that. However, there are a few similarities that they go about with some of their magical spells. And I want to talk about some of the similarities because I think that part is very interesting. So to prep you with this, I want to go by what a witch really is. 
Now, historically speaking, not from a movies or anything like that, a witch is uh, a person who is worse with magic, and um, and they were the healers, they were the doctors, they were the ones that um, helped people, okay, uh, within their particular community. Like within Wicca, what you'd see is if someone had a fever and they're really sick, they would call the witch, and the witch would come in and then cast a spell to make them uh, heal faster. Uh, the witch would then create some sort of a potion. And a lot of times, different potions use different ingredients, which we'll talk about later within this video. But um, one of the key ingredients with uh, people who were sick or had a high fever was white willow bark. It's used worldwide to take down fevers and to help uh, people who are ill. Um, but back then, they looked at it like I can use the power or the magical power of this particular tree um, to make a certain potion or to make a tea uh, to help this individual um, become well. Well, nowadays we don't look at it like it's a magical thing. We look at it like an active ingredient, you know? So the, the mindset becomes different. But back then, it was a little different. They see they had this, they had this magical ritual and then they created this particular medicine or potion um, from the magical ingredients that was given to us from the gods. And uh, you see something similar to that within ninjutsu. And um, the reason I'm gonna bring this up is because in this particular book right here, and I'm gonna use the same, uh, the same spell that Anthony was talking about. He was talking about Inugakure, uh, the art of dog hiding. And it's, uh, you pull out the eyes of a black dog and dry them out in the shade for 100 days. Wrap them with red cloth and carry them. When you go on a covert mission, you should chant the following uh, 100 times, a buri unkan. And uh, it goes on and on and on. However, uh, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of it. However, with the same technique, there's an upper tradition. And the upper tradition, it says, when you go where there are dogs, you should take wrapped roasted rice that has unknown mixed in with it and packed tightly. If dogs come out, you should throw it at them and have the dogs eat it. If the dogs eat it, they will die. So when you look at this, okay, what I'm talking about is in witchcraft, in Wicca, we see that there is this, for someone that's, you know, ill, you do this particular ritual and you make them a potion, something physical. And even though you've done a magical ritual, you're giving them potion as well uh, that has magical ingredients uh, that's given to you from the gods and that will also help them get better. Um, what we see within this particular spell is you see that the ninja goes and uses things that has been given to them from the gods. They're using, um, you know, particular parts of animals that was obviously not man-made. They put that in the shade. They do this big ritual. However, there's an upper level transmission that says if you infiltrate with dogs, you want to make sure that you do this. And it's, you know, pack and rice. Obviously, it's if you feed it to the dogs, they will die. So, you know, more than likely it's going to be a plant um, or some sort of a fish that's poisonous, that if the dogs eat that particular rice ball, then they'll die. So again, what we see is a magical ritual followed by something that has a little bit more foundation in herbology. Now I can go on and on about different types of um, examples where, okay, back then the Wicca, um, the witches would use this plant or this particular herb and it would treat this particular disease, asthma, whatever, whatever, and the magical properties um, gave them this effect. And then people would say on this time, well, yeah, but in the modern day, the active ingredients like ephedra, and that's found in a lot of other asthma medicines. Same thing over here, you know, we see the ninja um, using this particular um, herbs and plants and things like that, and the magical ingredient was this, and then people would use the term active ingredient, which they would then translate it to another medicine that we see in the modern day. Um, so I can go on and on with a lot of those things. If you guys do follow my channel, then you guys know that I already teach that because I have lots of videos going over different kinds of plants and herbs and things like that in a lot of my Saison Jutsu videos. To end this particular video, I want to talk about um, a specific aspect to witchcraft. It doesn't matter whether it's Wicca or whether it's Ninjutsu. Um, I want to talk about this one aspect to um, witchcraft, and it's called transmission. Okay, transmission. And transmission is the knowledge of how it's passed down. There are two aspects of transmission that we're going to talk about in its relation to witchcraft. Okay, I'll make myself clear, okay? There is the written aspect okay and then there's the understanding of the written aspect and those are two completely different things one is 
words on paper, something that is documented, something that has been written down and preserved over time. And then this side is someone, after a long time, reads that and then tries to understand what was written many years ago and then translate that into the modern day. One thing that you see as a similarity within uh, the witch uh, in Wicca and uh, the shinobi of, uh, of Japan is that they had a specific alphabet that they used to hide or to keep their transmission secret. Um, now, the witch's alphabet, and it's the word that is used within people who practice witchcraft, it's called the witch's alphabet. There are many other words for this particular um, alphabet, um, but the witch's alphabet looks like this. And as you can see, this is a way that they would write down specific information to keep it secret so that if someone did come in, they wouldn't recognize them doing anything wrong. Um, the ninja, however, um, also had their own particular alphabet that's also mentioned within the Bon Sen Shukai, and uh, the ninja alphabet looked like this. And again, this is a way for them to write down or transmit information secretly between themselves and someone else. There's lots of writings that was not written in the witch's alphabet. Just the same, there are lots of writings um, and documents, scrolls, etc., etc., that are written not in the ninja alphabet. But what we see is that that particular type of writing does exist. So what that means is these groups of people thought what they were doing needed to be secret. And we have to understand and respect that. Now the other side of the, the coin is actually researching this is secret society. How can you research the old text, these old language, these old ideas, and translate that into modern language of what, something that we can understand? Now the reason I'm bringing all this up is because we always hear these stories of the witches using the, the, the head of a snake or using boiling babies and all this kind of stuff just so they can make some magical potion, you know? And uh, which we know in the modern day that it didn't exist. That's not what they did. You know, even the, the ancient ninja or shinobi, they used herbs and plants just like the witch and they used that magical properties to either aid them for health through sickness or to create poisons and things like that um, and use them within war. So when you look at the witch, we always see these stories of, you know, the boiling babies or the head of a snake and all this kind of stuff. What we see now is a language that has a Latin base. But back then, there wasn't a universal language that had a Latin base, particularly with plants and herbs. So what you saw was a regional dialect. You know, like an example. When you study uh, witchcraft or Wicca, when you start looking at some of the potions or healing um, potions and medicines and things like that, you learn to understand that tongue of snake is dog's tooth violet, rabbit's foot is field clover, cat's eye is star scabious, wolf's claw is lysopodium, flesh and blood is tormentil, snake's head is balmony, um, bloody fingers is foxglove, um, cat's foot is ground ivy. You know, all this kind of stuff, and you learn that what the old word was, and then what the new word is, and then how you can take that ingredient and that magical property to make the medicine or the magical potion that you're trying to create. When you're studying um, ninjutsu, this is my question to all you ninja enthusiasts out there, um, you should know the same thing. Okay, make sure that you guys research that, because a lot of the things that are said are actually herbs and plants that have a regional meaning and uh, it's not exactly the word that they use. So I think that's very, very important. Now, um, I'm not trying to make a reference to Inu Gakure whatsoever. I'm not saying that there's a, something in there you guys should look at. By no means am I calling out that technique. I use that as an example only because Anthony used that particular technique in his video. But when you guys study magic, Using the elements that we talk about from the Gogyo, um, using the particular elements and its magical properties is a major aspect of magic. And it doesn't matter whether it's Wicca or whether you're studying Ninjutsu. There's going to be a spiritual aspect of it, but there's also going to be a natural aspect or using nature or using the elements and its magical powers to your advantage, whether it's to heal someone or 
in the shinobi sense to create poisons so that you can carry out a mission. So when you guys research ninja magic, don't just look at it like, oh, well, the ninja, you know, cut the tail off of a fox. Because maybe foxtail is a particular herb um, that had a regional meaning at that particular time. Maybe they didn't actually cut the tail off of a fox. And like I said, I wanted to use the examples that we see in Wicca and traditional witchcraft and then give you that particular example. So, thank you guys very much for all your love and support. Um, like I said, if you guys are interested in authentic ninjutsu and traditional samurai bujutsu, please check out my website at www.budodininjutsu.com. There's going to be lots of updates coming up this month, and uh, hopefully you guys do enjoy all the new things that we'll be putting on our website. Also, the book that I referenced earlier in this particular video is called Iga and Koka Ninja Skills. The cover looks like this. You guys can find this book on Amazon.com. It is written by Anthony Cummins and Yoshie Minami, and it's the Secret Shinobi Scrolls of Chikimatsu Shikimatsu.